Welcome everyone to 284 News. My name is Javon Wilson. I'm Kamal Hins. And I'm Ron Grant. And we are so thrilled and happy to be coming to you live out of the beautiful British Virgin Islands. The content continues via our website, 284media.com. In today's news, fully vaccinated travelers with negative PCR or rapid tests done within 48 hours of arrival into the BVI no longer subjected to local rapid tests, says Minister Malone. We also see the government of the Virgin Islands to introduce a mangrove bank. A West End resident receives keys to new home through Housing Recovery Assistance Program. We also see the BVI under-20 football team finishing third in the CONCACAF Championship after a 1-0 victory against Dominica and a mother who recorded herself strangling uh, her toddler child in Barbados now released on bail. We have the details for these stories and so much more on today's edition of 284 News. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a brand new season of The Art of a Distinguished Gentleman, a show poised to help guide modern day men into 21st century distinguished gentlemen. It doesn't always involve suits and, uh, wait, bow ties, but raw, real life lessons that translate to grounded, community minded, well rounded men. This season, I'm taking you on an entirely different journey from chefs to dancers, philanthropists, communications specialists, and much more. I'm heading outside in the field to share the journey of some of the BBI's best and brightest men. From East End to West End, Bojangara, Jasmine, not forgetting Anigara. Our Virgin Islands gentlemen are doing the damn thing, and I'm so proud. Get ready to reason, reflect, and redirect. We are the movers and shakers of this generation, and we ain't afraid to show it. The Art of a Distinguished Gentleman, Season 3, by yours truly, Ron Grant, raising a generation of greatness. A beautiful Wednesday evening to one and all. It is Wednesday, November 17th, 2021, halfway through the news week. And of course, here to bring you your daily dose of 284 News. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Kamal Haynes coming to you live from the beautiful British Virgin Islands. Viewers, we start with news within the tourism industry where fully vaccinated travelers with a negative PCR or rapid antigen test conducted within 48 hours prior to arrival into the British Virgin Islands will no longer be subjected to previously mandatory rapid tests at any of the territory's ports of entry. But this is according to the COVID-19 Control and Suppression Entry of Persons Number no. 3, Amendment No. 5, Regulations 2021, which was published in the government's official gazette on Tuesday, November 16th. Well, Section 5A of the Act outlines the new measures that all fully vaccinated travellers will now abide by. Well, it states, and I quote, Well, a person who is fully vaccinated and presents a RT-PCR or approval rapid antigen SARS-CoV-2 um, negative test result taken no longer than 48 hours before arrival in the territory and his or her vaccination card in accordance with Regulation 5 shall A, not be required to be tested for COVID-19 upon arrival into the territory and B, be allowed to move freely within the territory subject to adhering to the relevant COVID-19 enactments and protocols in the territory including the relevant physical distancing protocols, wearing of masks and sanitization measures, end quote. Well, following the publication of the new regulation, some residents stuck to social media stating that they did not quite understand what the rule change meant. Well, according to some of their comments, that their confusion stemmed from the uncertainty as to whether this change now meant that only tests conducted within 48 hours will be the only tests approved for entry into the BVI. Well, others queried what is the stance for those persons who have already taken their test within the original five-day period and have already commenced their journey to the territory. Well, our new station obviously reached out to the Minister for, of Health, Carvin Malone, who clarified a new policy which came into effect from today, well, sorry, that was yesterday, November 16. Well, he said the policy in summary is to benefit those fully vaccinated travelers who take their test 48 hours prior to arrival in the BVI, as they are the ones who will be exempted from taking a rapid test when arriving in the BVI, therefore saving themselves from having to pay the $50 rapid test fee. I have to see if the wording is misleading. Well, it's not misleading. It's a misunderstanding. Um, if you're not vaccinated, you still have to do the PCR test, and it's still within the five-day period. However, if you're fully vaccinated and you do a antigen test or PCR, anyone, 
within 48 hours and you come into the territory, you would not be required to do a rapid test on arrival in the territory. So it is to facilitate those persons who are fully vaccinated coming into the territory. We don't want them, in order to be exempt from taking the rapid test on arrival, they would have to uh, take the test, take the rapid test, because, you know, that could be had within a half an hour period. They'll be required to take the rapid test from an approved WHO uh, manufacturer within 48 hours, and then they would be allowed to enter and not be subjected to a test on arrival. But if you're not vaccinated or if you're partially vaccinated, you're still subjected to the PCR test and quarantine within the particular period. Of your section 5A2 further explain that fully vaccinated persons who test 48 hours prior to arrival into the BVI but then lose proof of their testing date or unfortunately experience a delay in their flight will be made to take a rapid test on arrival into the territory. While it states, and I quote, a person who would have obtained his or her RT-PCR or approved rapid antigen SARS-CoV-2 negative test result taken no later than 48 hours before arrival in the territory in accordance with the sub-regulation 1, but is unable to present the results to enter the territory within the 48 hours time period for reasons such as delays and overnight layovers, shall be required to undertake a rapid antigen SARS-CoV-2 test on the day of arrival in the territory, end quote. Uh, but Javon, um, for some, this is some very great news, um, especially for those persons who were complaining that, you know, I'm, neg I'm COVID negative um, prior to arriving in the territory and now I'm here and I still have to pay a, a $50 fee. Um, for those persons, they would basically welcome this with open arms. And we also understand the other arguments from those persons who also state that, you know, well, you know, it's, it's, it's essential that you basically have this rule still in place because some persons may take their test, um, you know, somewhat prior to the um, arrival and then, you know, obviously in transit to the territory, then therefore obviously pick up the virus. And we, you know, we would have seen some countries, such as Barbados, for example, um, removing that rule. And then obviously their cases would have started to, 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 to skyrocket after a period of time. So I, we, I do understand both arguments and, and we, you know, for, for those, for some is a win, for others is a concern. You know, what's most important here is the clarity that comes as a result of the amendment. And clearly, the minister has highlighted that even in the event of certain circumstances, that they will be required to test upon arrival. But I will say this, uh, I, especially the tourism industry in particular, have been truly calling for us to have um, more accessible entry into the BVI, being that the BVI so highly depend on travel and travel tourism. Um, so removing this fee comes as a welcome and refreshing initiative for so many persons, not only locals, but tra uh, tourists alike, uh, who consider a $50 fee to enter the BVI, especially since they would have just tested negative uh, in their uh, initial country to come here they consider it to be a burden and so i'm happy that we're making moves towards clearly this is an improvement uh before you know you were required to take that test but what we see not only in the bvi and across the region but also across the world is the world over is making things easier for the vaccinated and it just shows that this is the direction that the bvi is heading as well and i'm sure the legislators would have been obviously following the um, advice from the experts you know with the, in terms of the statistics with the epidemi epidemiologists basically giving the um the information that would help guide such um change in law because obviously um the bvi would have been seen somewhat of a, as a very strict um had a very strict approach when compared to the other countries initially Absolutely. so i'm sure that you know they're guided um accordingly with um according to the experts advice and and really doubling back on the importance of us as a collective doing what we we need to do uh they're also guided by the fact that as residents of this territory we too are abiding by those protocols policing ourselves and truly taking uh self-responsibility in this pandemic and i think that's what is going to really call for for us uh to be able to move forward as we move on, the Minister for Natural Resources, Labor and Immigration, Honorable Vincent Whitley, has said that the government of the Virgin Islands will be upscaling the mangrove nursery to a mangrove bank as it seeks to benefit from and participate in the blue carbon market. 
Now, viewers, Honorable Whitley made the announcement following his return to the territory after attending the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow from October 20. 31st, sorry, October 31st, that is, to November 12th. Honorable Whitley said, apart from, from the introduction of the Mangrove Bank, that government will also, and I quote, strengthen legislation geared towards the protection of the environment, increase and encourage the use of renewable energy systems, electric cars, and energy-saving light bulbs, end of quote. The minister was also part of the official UK Overseas Territories Association delegation, which attended the COP26 summit to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The other two overseas territory members who were a part of the delegation were officials from Anguilla, Bermuda, Cayman, Gibraltar, and Turks and Caicos Islands. The team also hosted an event on nature and land use on November 6th. The event explored how the UK overseas territories are taking action to counter and mitigate the effects of global warming and how they are safeguarding precious marine environments uh, as well. Sorry, Participants signed an agreement pledging to reduce their carbon footprints by 2030. Now, viewers, Honorable Whitley said, and I quote, I thought it was very important that the voices of the overseas territories be heard loud and clear as we hold over 90% of the UK's biodiversity. If sufficient funding is not secured for the protection of our environment, the, cons the consequences will be dire. The BVI is fully committed to doing its part to reduce the race to zero, end of quote. Now, viewers, the goals of COP26 are to secure a global uh, net zero by mid-century and, of course, to keep 1.5 degrees within reach, adapt to protect communities and natural habitats, mobilize finance, and work together to deliver. The government of the Virgin Islands will continue, they say, to implement legislation to safeguard the natural resource of the territory while exploring feasible methods to ensure sustainability and economic growth. Kamal, uh, not only am I proud to see the representation we've had at this particular summit, but truly uh, when you think about the BVI, in particular the BVI tourism product, the environment is a critical part of what sustains the BVI tourism product. And, and not only that, when we think about climate change, the fact that we live in a hurricane prone region, uh, it really reiterates uh, the stance that we should be taken as a collective, as an environment, as a, a territory to safeguard ourselves against future damage. Indeed, and obviously we do know the, the significance and the importance of mangrove to the territory in, uh, in, in helping um, prevent erosion, etc. Well, viewers, well, up next, West End resident receives keys to new home through Housing Recovery Assistance Program. A mother who recorded herself strangling toddler's child in Barbados released on bail. Well, we get to these stories after a word from our sponsors. You value traditions. To You value music. You value education. Family. I love you. <laughs> Service. Thank you. You're welcome. Love. Life. At Popular, we're committed to you and everything our community values. For the things you value the most, count on us. Popular. Well, welcome back, viewers. Well, Freshwater Pond West End resident Franklin Smith received the keys to a newly built home on behalf of Troy Smith and the Smith family as part of the Housing Recovery Assistance Program. Well, the keys were presented by Minister for Health and Social Development Carmen Malone, who commended his ministry for delivering such a project. Well, he said, and I quote, It is pleasing that the Ministry of Health has struck has st stuck sorry, to their guns and have worked tirelessly with whatever resources that they were given to get our people back into homes. We would like to thank the Ministry's Housing Recovery Assistance Unit for their steadfast work. We would like to thank the Premier for allocating the funds to make sure that through this process, homes will be built until everyone is home." End quote. While also present at the handing over ceremony was Premier and District Representative Andrew Foy, who said that the monies have been allocated in, to the, in the upcoming 2020 national budget to keep occasions like this a reality. While he said, and I quote, 
It is a joy to help people in need and even with the upcoming budget, we have quite a few millions allocated to help many more people to get homes who lost their homes during Irma and Maria and even during some of these trying economic times of COVID-19, end quote. But Premier Foy stood um, true to his word and his promise as he subsequently revealed during his delivery of the 2022 budget speech last week that in 2021, a total of 34 hurricane damaged homes will be fully repaired thanks to the housing recovery program. Well, he said in 2022, his government has allocated monies to deliver on constructing 13 new homes, repair 25 damaged homes, and issue 14 grants to go towards rebuilding homes. The Ministry of Health and Social Development have a broad range of functions, one of which is social programs. In 2021, through the housing recovery program, hurricane repairs to 34 homes were completed. This means that 34 persons in the Virgin Islands who are affected from Oma and Maria were able to get the keys to the new home as a result of this program. For this to God be all the glory. Three social homes were built. A fourth scheduled for completion next month. Two rebuild grants were issued. Another two should be completed by year's end. In 2022, the ministry intention is to construct 13 additional social homes, repair an additional 25 homes that were damaged by Irma and Maria, and complete the process for the issue of 14 rebuild grants. Or people continue to get help, but we still have much more to do. Well, meanwhile, Franklin Smith expressed gratitude on behalf of his family to receiving the keys to their new family home. Well, viewers, the Housing Recovery Assistance Program is designed to help homeowners be rebuilt in the wake of hurricanes Irma and Maria in accordance with the provisions of the Virgin Islands Housing Recovery Policy and Hurricane Irma Recovery Plan. All right, not the first, second, or third for the year. So kudos to the government for a job well done. I know the persons, especially within this territory, who would have suffered uh, severe damages as a result of this hurricane are very happy about the assistance being provided. As we move on and look in the region, a mother who admitted to mistreating her one-year-old daughter in a case captured on video has finally been released on bail. As you can see in that video, viewers, the tearful mother who was remanded to prison in October was warned by the island's chief magistrate that children must not be used as pawns in any situation after she explained that she had made the video ill-treating her child simply to get the attention of the child's father. The magistrate said, and I quote, children are innocent and must be protected. The fact that you did not understand that your child should not be used as a pawn to get his attention tells me you have some serious work to be done and we have to work seriously with you, end of quote. Now, viewers, the magistrates also told the woman who, uh, her name is Shanice Nikita Alicia Reese of Christchurch in the magistrate's court that I'm sorry, he reassured the court that while Reese needs the necessary help and counseling, that she would have to reflect on her actions during a short period of remand. The woman, uh, who is 27 years old, was remanded last month. Now, viewers, she pleaded guilty, uh, and she do also have other children. She pleaded guilty on the offense of willfully ill-treating her child in a manner likely to cause unnecessary suffering. Now, viewers, uh, the magistrate went on to say, and I quote, members of the public must understand that there are consequences. I intend to get you counseling early, but I need you to reflect before I give you that counseling. End of quote. Now, just earlier this week on Tuesday, the mother was granted $3,000 bail with one surety uh, when she appeared before the same chief magistrate, Mr. Eon Weeks, in the District A Magistrate's Court. As part of her bill conditions, she must have no contact with the child unless it is through the child care board as well as the child's father unless it pertains directly to the infant. The convicted mother is expected to meet with a probation officer on November 19th about counseling. Now, viewers, Reese, who was represented by attorneys Mr. Michael Lashley QC, Simon and Clark, uh, as well as Ken Mason, quite a tragic story. Uh, but I think, you know, bringing up 
as well come out many learning lessons. Clearly the judge understands within this case and based on the seriousness of the offense committed by this mother that not only are we dealing with a situation where a crime was committed but as a community uh, the judge understanding that we really need to reach back and provide assistance to mothers to parents to fathers in general to ensure that we are healing and uh, co-creating a safe environment for our children indeed and um, despite her reasoning for doing such a horrendous action towards an infant um, is a child uh, 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 is a child basically who suffers yes. in, the, in the long run because mm -hmm. um, uh, for some parents who, who may not be ready for to, uh, to become a, a parent, they, their actions live within us um, Absolutely. years after. And, and you know, not every child um, you know can heal from that type of trauma too. So we again, it's really about ensuring that. And I, I really love that the, the the judge, even as a, a man, recognizing the importance of treatment and counseling within the community and extending that grace to her but also i hope that within that process the father too can be appealed to because it really requires a unit to raise up a child well, Javon, in all honesty um when that video would have been circulating in the heat of that particular time period the barbadian public generally generally was heated uh, yes. when they would have seen that video mm -hmm. um calling for her to be mm -hmm. given life and, and you know just some some yes some harsh from very harsh punishments for uh, mm -hmm. for for for, for this, this um basically displaying such an action on a child an yes. innocent child that innocent is innocent child so yeah. um we we do hope she gets the necessary treatment she, she um she needed and that she doesn't ever or no other mother does such or father does such to their child um going forward well viewers up next the bvi on the 20 football team finished third in the concacaf championship after a 1-0 victory against dominica and their, that was their second consecutive win. And we also see Jamaica's police declaring a war on loud mortar bikes. Well, we get to these two last stories after a word from our sponsors. Welcome back, viewers. Well, the British Virgin Islands under-20 football team finished the CONCACAF under-20 championships in third position after defeating Dominica 1-0 on Saturday, November 13th to end the tournament with consecutive victories. But well, a lone goal came from Jake Forbes in the 38th minute as he calmly converted a penalty to give the local boys a needed victory. But well, speaking after the victory, Forbes said he took many positives from the game and hoped the victory made the BVI proud. Well, he said on a quote, well, their players were trying to put me off before taking it back, but I'm glad to I scored and hopefully I've done my country proud. I was incredibly pleased with the overall team spirit throughout the tour. But these, uh, there were many positives and things that we can build on, end quote. But Captain Malachi Stanner said his team continued to grow in confidence despite the rough start to the tournament. Well, he said on a quote, but the team was much more confident due to the win against St. Martin and built on the positives that the team um, would have received to give us the upper hand. We did have a rough start to the tournament, but to come back and win two games is amazing. While well, also commenting on the team's success was the BVI Football Association's president, Andy Bickerton. Well, he said the teams collectively um, came together and relied on each other's individual moments to pull off the victory. We came into this game with with three of our top players out, Luca Chalwell was out, Kai Kai was out, and EJ was out. We knew we had a hell of a lot of work to do. And boys came in and just gave 100%, worked hard. We won by a penalty, but hey, look, it could have been three or four. 
you know, we went very close and we controlled them. You know, we did not let Dominica get into the game and play football. We harassed them and chased them. And, you know, you work hard. It's like life, isn't it? If you work real hard, you get the benefits. Having won two games, got six points, we're now going to finish third in our group out of five. And, uh, you know, we're so pleased about that. We get our first win in under-20 football in a World Cup qualifier yesterday. And we follow, up at, follow it up at, uh, today against all of the odds. And, you know, we had great performances out there. You know, Mickey Walters, again, was great in goal. Uh, Jake Forbes up front was just constantly causing problems. Uh, he had a great game. But, you know, again, it, it's real difficult to pick out players. Um, you know, Malachi Stanners captained us today. He held the team together. He played out of position in the centre of the defence. Justin Smith was his normal, unbelievable self, backwards and forwards. You know, these guys played for themselves. They played for their country. It's national pride, that's what it is. Rob Bickerton also said that the focus will now be placed on strengthening the weaknesses observed during the tournament ahead of future international competitions. Yeah, we have to find more competition. Obviously, you know, Coach Chris Keon was here um, looking at players he wants to bring on the national squad. And there's a good number of players out there over the last two or three days particularly that have, that have come to his notice and showed him what big hearts they have and uh, what potential they have. I mean, what we have to do now is when the boys get back to Tortola, uh, our coaches have to work with them on their weaknesses. Now, Coach Chris will have identified their weaknesses and we have to make sure that our home coaches work with our players to help them improve themselves. Because if we can come out here and win two games like this in a tough group, and then we spend time with our players to improve themselves, what are we going to be like when we, we do improve ourselves? Because we now understand how to play in a system, and we now understand how we have to support each other, and we now understand how we have to run for 90 minutes. Well, meanwhile, national coach Chris Kewomia said the BVI team played as though they wanted the victory more than their opponents. Well, he said he will be working with members of the team to have them sharpen their skills. Well, I think this game shows today just what the boys can do. You know, they work really hard. Obviously, the first two games were disappointing, but we had a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations, a lot of heart to heart, and they'll come out and show the desire to do everybody proud, including themselves and the people on the island. So. You know, I'm really proud of them and the, and the work that they put in today. In both the last two games, we wanted it more than the opposition and we got our, uh, our just rewards. Well, viewers, after losing their first game 7-0 against Caruso, the BVI bounced back to defeat St. Martin 1-0 prior to their second victory against Dominica. As we begin to close out, members of the Public Safety and Traffic Enforcement Branch in Jamaica on Friday conducted an operation to clamp down on owners of motorcycles said to be committing breaches while traveling on the road. Members of the police team said, and I quote, We are paying attention to the motorcycles with the loud mufflers as well as those that are unlicensed. Now, viewers, during the clamp down, several motorcycles were seized and the drivers were issued with tickets, as you can see in that video. However, some of the drivers were not in agreement with the seizure and claimed that the police were unjust in their operations. One motorcycle owner said he did not adjust or modify his muffler and that his motorcycle was brought into the island exactly that way. But, viewers, it was still seized. We saw it important to bring you... Uh, what's happening in the region regarding the store because a similar challenge presents itself here where bike riders of course are of the opinion that they should be allowed to ride with those mufflers while residents continue to complain about the noise nuisance and of course the police continue to do what they can to bring some calm to the matter. Viewers that is all the time we have for today but we encourage you to join us again tomorrow for more 284 News. My name is Javon Wilson. And I'm Kamal. Here's viewers. Have a great evening.